All right, welcome back to Canna Week, brought to you by New Frontier Data, where we deliver the week's top headlines in cannabis and hear experts weigh in on the impacts these stories are having on the industry. I'm your host, Heather Wickline. Uh, before we get started, if you are loving this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, leave us a five-star review, and share this episode. Uh, today, we are talking about the intersection of cannabis and justice. Now, this has been a huge topic for years, but it has been getting a lot more attention recently, um, and due particularly to activists like our first guest today. Uh, she is the youngest of nine children to the late and legendary Peter Tosh. She is the founder of the Peter Tosh Foundation, executive director of the Peter Tosh Brand and Legacy, curating council member of the Core Social Justice Cannabis Museum, and the board member of Minorities for Medical Marijuana. Please welcome Niambi McIntosh. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us. Um, and as always, we are pleasure. I'm pleased to welcome back our Chief Knowledge Officer at New Frontier Data, Mr. John Kadia. Yeah, delighted to be back, Heather. Thank you for having me. Of course. Now, Niambi, your family has such a long history and connection to the cannabis culture. Um, before starting the Peter Tosh Foundation in 2017, you were a public school teacher in Boston. Is that right? Yes, yes. I um, was I was born in Jamaica, but uh, raised in Boston and uh, went to an Institute of written with Institute of Technology, where I was an engineer for a while, but then did a career change and, and had always had a passion for for teaching as well as children. So I, I was a Boston public school teacher um, for 10 years. That's uh, truly admirable. Um, having three kids, it's <laughs> you have to have a lot of patience <laughs> to do. Yes, you do. Really long. Yes, you do. <laughs> um, well, can you share with us? I know it's a it's a difficult story, but what inspired you to create this foundation and how this kind of how you went from public schools teaching to creating this foundation and becoming such a loud voice in this in this space. Yes. Um, so just to back up a little bit, I, I actually only took over my father's estate in 2010. He passed away in 1987, mm -hmm. but uh, the family didn't really learn that it was something for us to take a hold of um, until later on. And so um, in 2010, the family finally was in control over the estate. And, um, you know, as we start to see the progression of legalization around um, the United States, starting with Colorado, uh, we, we knew that we wanted to have um, the legacy be a part of the cannabis space. Um, so literally and figuratively, it was really important for us to have a foundation, you know, that um, we can build from. I, I needed it to be, we knew that my father stood for more than just selling cannabis, even though the theme song is legalize it and I'll advertise it. Um, you know, he was a, a, a an activist in his own right. And so starting the foundation was um, really important so that when we uh, did launch our, you know, our for-profit entity and, and space and, and, and brand, we would have a driving force that was doing good in the community and making change. Um, and so it wasn't until um, 2017 where I actually just decided to quit teaching. Um, my brother, uh, Jawara, the, the youngest son uh, of my dad, was arrested actually in 2013 for cannabis possession. Um, it was Father's Day weekend and um, he was in New Jersey. And we honestly thought that, um, you know, he's never been involved with the criminal justice system before. Um, he's a father of four. He's a follower of Rastafari, an activist, a musician uh, who goes by the name of Tosh One. We thought that this would be something that would just kind of be put behind us. Um, he actually was arrested Father's Day weekend and then didn't have his first hearing until September of that same year, 2013. So it was you know, a few months before just even knowing what the charges were um, that would be brought to him. And so um, we were where my family's based in Boston, my mom and I and um, his, his partner, we all drove, you know, down to New Jersey to support him. And that was the first time we heard the prosecution offer a 20 year uh, plea deal. Um, and th that's when we knew that this was really something, you know, bigger than what we had anticipated. Uh, fortunately, he was able to make bail at the end of that year um, and went back and forth from Boston um, to, to Hackensack, New Jersey, Bergen County, New Jersey, um, and being told that, you know, the, this is the lowest plea deal that we could offer, you know, by, by attorneys and, and, 
and it going down from 20 to 15 and, you know, 15 to 10. And um, we were really torn because we, we know that cannabis for my family as followers of Rastafari, we believe when we recognize the plant as a sacrament, it's very much a part of our lives, uh, our spiritual practice, our, our everyday just well-being, and wanted to fight for that, especially as we saw cannabis starting to become legalized around the country. But on the other hand, um, you know, when you look at the statistics involved with New Jersey in mass incarceration, they have the highest um, mass incarceration in the country. And so we were faced with, you know, fighting for what we believed in versus, you know, being made an example of. Um, and so the plea deal actually got down to about five years. And my brother was told that, you know, if you, if you accept this plea, you know, um, you probably will only serve about a year, you know, a year or time served. You've already been in for six months. You, you know, this is something that I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll just serve and get put behind you. Um, and for the sake of, you know, his children, he said, you know, instead of going to trial and potentially getting hit with the full 20 years, maybe this is something that um, I should take. And, and at least it'll be something I can put, get, you know, put behind, put behind him. And so in, 2016, my brother uh, Jawar accepted the plea. And in January of 2017, he turned himself into Bergen County Jail. Um, it was a, a month later when I received a call um, from my mother and she was frantic on the phone. She was crying uh, and she told me, Niambi, there's a, there's a surgeon on the phone and it's about Gamel, it's his middle name is what we call called him and she said, there's, there's something about, about Gamel, I don't, I don't know. And so the surgeon says to me, he says, um, hi Niambi, um, so-and-so uh, from Hackensack Medical Center and I need authorization to perform a life-saving medical procedure on your brother. He's been attacked by another inmate and has suffered a traumatic brain injury. Um, we need to perform brain surgery. Um, and so we authorized the, per, the procedure, obviously, and immediately, you know, we all got together and flew to New Jersey. Um, when we arrived at Hackensack Medical Center to visit him, they told us that we weren't even allowed to see him. They said, your brother is a ward of the state and you have to call the jail in order to get visitation. Um, and so, you know, when we call the jail, now the jail's telling us, um, you know, we normally don't allow visitation. You know, and that's not something that is that is that is acceptable. That's not part of our rules. And you know, we pushed and pushed, and I know that it was because of who my father was, why they made the exception. Um, and so we were able to see Jawara. And when we got into the um, surgical ICU, uh, Jawara was, um, he had a bruised up face, half of his locks were shaved off of his head. He was connected to oxygen, um, fighting for his life, tubes down his throat, uh, neck cuff on, um, and he had a handcuff on his ankle and he was surrounded by correctional officers. And um, it was that moment, honestly, where I knew Take your time. I knew that it was bigger than me. I knew that I couldn't even think, think about teaching and I knew that I had a bigger cause um, to think that cannabis, um, a plant that has never harmed anyone um, would result in my brother fighting for his life was unacceptable. And so um, unfortunately, um, my brother was completely incapacitated at that point, um, unable to walk, talk, uh, do anything for himself. Um, and so after a, a year and a half of being in the hospital, uh, my family was able to bring him home um, where we, my mom and I cared for him around the clock with the support of nurses. Um, but in 2020, unfortunately, my brothers had succumbed to his injuries and, and passed away. And so um, it was in 2017 where we launched Justice for Jawara. And, you know, we're, we're bringing awareness to his story because 
so many people hear about, you know, um, the, the need for social equity and social justice around cannabis legalization, but to understand how the war on drugs has truly impacted not just individuals, but families. You know, my brother is a father of four. He um, is a leader in the community, you know, and a lot of people and one of the few men in my family, you know, and that just, you know, com sits a complete imbalance within my life and, and of course in the community that we come from. And so there has to be, a, you know, there has, there's a need for legalization to happen as soon as possible. And that was really what has kind of pushed me into, um, you know, this activist role is it's, it's direct impact on me. And so people ha can understand that change has to happen now. I couldn't agree more. And I just really applaud you for taking such a active role in this. I and mean, when some people could, you know, just succumb to the despair of the situation. Um, it's, it's unbelievable. And I'm sure your, your dad and your brother are very proud of what you're doing. Thank you. Um, John, do you have any, any questions for Niambi? I know that you've seen her speak before and we're very impressed. Well, uh, first, thank you for, for sharing this extraordinary story. Um, you know, it makes one realize part of the tension in this conversation around legalization is um, there are so many in this country who just don't understand what happens after the arrest, um, who don't understand uh, this, this kind of profoundly dark side of the criminal justice system that um, many people who are nonviolent uh, offenders, people who get caught in this dragnet, end up having to experience once they get into the system. Um, I'm curious, what have you found to be kind of the biggest challenge in your advocacy as you're trying to get people to understand just how bad it gets on the other side um, of the court case, on the other side of uh, the jailhouse doors? Honestly, I think it's, um, it's reaching an audience that is not like-minded. You know, uh, we often find ourselves in cannabis circles where people are at least open to the idea of hearing about it. They know about the benefits of cannabis. They are usually um, pro-legalization. Uh, and so I think that the biggest barrier is, you know, being able to access a, a different audience where we can truly open their eyes because so many people are still brainwashed from, you know, the propaganda of the 1930s and, and cannabis prohibition and the war on drugs and the images throughout the 80s and 90s of Black people, um, you know, being the perpetrators of, of this, this um war, so to speak. And uh, there has to be a shift where more people understand the direct impact on families. Um, there's so many people that hear the word, you know, uh, convict or felon, you know, my brother technically was one of those and it dehumanize, dehumanizes people, you know, and, and so I think that it's important to just bridge that gap and be able to reach um, a different audience. Yeah, I mean, I feel like even if you're not pro cannabis, you're 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 a son, you're a father, you're a daughter, you're a mother. That touches you, regardless of how you feel about that. And then you take that juxtaposition of someone you know that's a violent criminal, you know, that's a, a rapist, a murderer. They are getting almost similar sentences than a cannabis conviction. It's it's really, I think that could be the most eye opening thing. You don't necessarily have to be pro cannabis, but they have to at least accept, like, you know, accept the fact that this is completely out of control at this point. Definitely, definitely. Oh my gosh. Um, well, I before we get into the article, I do wanna make a note for our listeners that um, the date of this recording is April 1st, 2022. The MORAC has just passed in the House. Um, so it is now moving on to the Senate. Um, and the MORE Act would decriminalize cannabis, uh, provide, re uh, provide for reinvestment in people and communities negatively, negatively impacted by the war on drugs and provide for expungement of certain cannabis off offenses, is, uh, which is currently being voted on. So if this comes out next week, it might change uh, <laughs> the conversation a little bit, but um, all right, Benzinga.com reported South Dakota Governor Nome vetoes marijuana expungement bill and calls it bad precedent for criminal justice. So 
recently she vetoed the government the marijuana expungement bill the bill provides for automatic removal of class one misdemeanors related to the use or possession of marijuana or any of its derivatives from public background checks in an official statement the governor said quote even with the legalization of medical cannabis there must remain consequences for using illegal drugs at a time when the use and possession of marijuana even for alleged medical purposes was illegal so i i Niambi, this couldn't be, you know, hit home more for you. How would you respond to this argument that consequences should not be retroactive, retroactively adjusted based on the current law? That's um, ridiculous. We live in a country where at one point in history, it was illegal for Black people to sit in the front of the bus. And when we look at the laws that have been created, um, many of them have been unjust. And so there is no way that we should um, we should belittle the experiences of people that um, truly have made this legalized industry possible. The legacy industry, without the legacy industry, there wouldn't be these multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar legal industry that exists today. Without the people that were in need of the plant and the people that supplied the plant, the demand wouldn't exist. And so it's unfair that you can say, oh, all of these people from this point on can now financially benefit from the, the, the trials and tribulations and bloodshed and tears and hardships of the people that um, made the industry possible. It's, it's unacceptable. The, you know, expungements has to be put at the forefront, um, putting money into the communities, not necessarily into the police force, because I've seen that happen um, time and time again, but really looking at how we can uplift these communities so that uh, some of these harms are balanced out um, is a priority, point blank period. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. John, what's your take on that? Anything to add? Maybe just three points, because I think it's really important to understand the context which we ended up with cannabis being illegal in the first place. So, you know, the, the, the fast forwarding through the long season between uh, the early 1900s and, and the 1950s, early 60s, um, when you saw this momentum around prohibition building, but just getting to the point where Nixon was on the cusp of uh, creating the drug war in its current form, um, we too often or too quickly forget that um, a blue panel commission had been had been put had been established that was supposed to um, uh, provide recommendations to the administration on how federal how cannabis should be regulated federally. The Schaefer Commission spent two years speaking to public health experts, epidemiologists, social scientists, um, educators, people in the medical prof profession. It was an extraordinarily robust basis of research. They came back with recommendations saying that cannabis should be treated as a public health, not a criminal justice issue. Nixon rejected those recommendations because cannabis was a really easy canard to use against the, um, the uh, anti-war activists and, and, and the black community um, uh, in a way that, that allowed him to continue to be kind of uh, challenge these groups uh, who were undermining his efforts, particularly around the war, war in Vietnam. So there was already a robust basis of, of experts who had looked deeply at this issue and said, cannabis shouldn't be illegal, it should not be criminalized. And yet for political reasons, it was criminalized. Second, I think Niambi makes a really important point around um, even if you assume that cannabis was the cannabis prohibition was a just law, and I think there's robust debate about that, um, its enforcement has been totally unjust. The, the inequity with which cannabis prohibition has been enforced um, makes it very hard to say that um, the, the, um, the, the law has been applied equally in this country because clearly it has not. If, if black and white Americans consume at similar rates, but you, you are four times uh, as likely to be arrested nationally on average if you're black than if you're white as a consumer. In some states you're as high as eight, nine, or 10 times more likely to be arrested if you're black rather than white, begs the question, um, why is there such drastic inequality in, in enforcement? Um, you know, we, we live in Washington, DC, which had one of the highest inequities in the country. And it wasn't kids at Georgetown University that were getting busted, it was kids on the wrong side of the Anacostia River uh, that were going to jail. Um, and then third is, you know, we can't take prohibition out of the, 
out of um, prohibition and its enforcement out of the context of the impact that it, it has had on our communities. Uh, I think Nyambi's story is a perfect illustration of what canvas prohib prohibition has done to young black men at the most promising moments in their lives. And, you know, we talk about the, the challenges that the black community has faced without male role models, without um, uh, having kind of a strong base of, of father figures in the space. And if so many of these men are getting locked up for minor cannabis offenses or having their most productive years being impeded because they've got uh, a cannabis record that prevents them from getting student loans, getting uh, uh, financial loans to pursue business opportunities, uh, uh, being able to participate fully in the economy, it creates this cascading impact where a minor, a very minor cannabis offense at 17, 18, 19, 20 years old becomes a yoke around your neck for the rest of your life. And so, you know, to, to, to blanketly say that just because it is illegal, uh, it was illegal at the time that one was intercepted by the law means that this should be a yoke that carries you. That may be true for, for some of the types of laws, but I think there's been a particular inequity with which the way cannabis has, uh, cannabis prohibition has manifested and been enforced in the country that I think makes a very strong argument that um, even though there have been people who, uh, who, who there remain a lot of people who are who were intercepted uh, before it became legal, um, that, that there should be reconsideration, particularly of the nonviolent offenders in that context. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, John, you and I have talked about how just clearing up the stigma with people with the personal stories, you know, that, you know, having, hearing that, you know, your grandma or whoever is using cannabis for, you know, glaucoma or something, it kind of has that personal touch to this. And I feel like that's why it's so important to have this, you know, a spotlight put on stories like yours, Nyambi and your brother to show that, you know, this is, this is a, a father of four. I mean, this is not some violent criminal. Um, it's, it's really, really hard to watch. Um, now, Niambi, how do you how do you think the um, you know expungement factor uh, you know factors into the broader cannabis justice movement? Uh, I I think that it has to be um, made a priority. Um, you know, there's there's been a lot of priority in just like opening up dispensaries, and I, I think that's important. Uh, but to to have people um, either incarcerated or um, or not incarcerated, but they have this, this kind of debilitating track record where, you know, they, they can't get housing, they, they may not be able to get certain jobs. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's very, it's unfair to exist within that type of dichotomy where on one hand, all these people get to kind of benefit financially and, and lucratively from, from the plant, but then you have people that are stuck, you know, unable to really better their lives, uh, better their lives of their families due to, um, you know, their, their judicial record. So it, I think that it has to be made a priority so that we can balance this 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 industry out um, social justice you know a country is not going to truly benefit from holistically if we don't focus on our most vulnerable population when you lift up the most vulnerable population you lift up everybody everyone can truly benefit but when you continue to um, maintain uh, ga gaps of wealth, gaps of education access, uh, gaps of housing, uh, you, you then create opportunities where, you know, the society truly um, doesn't really serve everyone. And so I think that expungement needs to be put, you know, on, on the put first. I agree. Now, speaking of social justice, what are your thoughts on the um, the social justice provisions that are um, in the Moore Act? Um, I I think that they are a great start. Um, I think that some things are left are, are are a little bit subjective when you say you know support communities 
um, that are harmed. You know, I've seen that be taken, you know, in, in maybe certain states where, okay, there's like, okay, we'll just give, you know, most of this money to the police force, or we'll give most of this money to, to veterans. And, um, you know, I think that I understand where that intent comes from. Maybe it's educating the police force on how to enter into communities and deal with, um, you know, interactions around cannabis. Yes, that's important, but a majority of the money um, should not, should go to the people that have been impacted by cannabis prohibition. And I think that how how um, that needs to really be, be a focus and needs to be outlined specifically so that people can truly benefit, you know, expungement clinics, automatic expungement, I think needs to be important. Um, without that, you leave the burden on um, the individual to now figure out how to navigate the judicial system to clear their record. And I've seen in Massachusetts where the stipulations are so, um, unclear where it's like, okay, if the, the offense has to be within this time, you know, from three years or to seven years, and it's this quantity versus that quantity. And um, it has to be, there's so many stipulations where the average individual just coming out of prison or jail is not going to know how to navigate. And so it should not be the burden of the individual. They didn't arrest themselves. It should be on the country and on the states to have automatic expungen expungement. They have the records, you know, they have a database and it, that, it should be that simple. So I, I definitely think that there, there should be some um, fine tuning and um, a lot more detail into what social equity and social justice uh, looks like. John, would you agree with that? Just needing it to be a little bit more defined in there. I would, and and you know, I think the the part of the consideration is just how many people are impacted by this or implicated by this. Um, so, so absolutely, the, the, I think one the rules are being written by. Sometimes it feels like the rules are being written by people who don't understand the system. Um, because if you did um, but, but understand the system in part, uh, partly based on understanding the challenges, uh, particularly people who are incarcerated face reintegrating the society. And then two, uh, the, the, the written by people who don't understand the scale of what is being discussed here. So um, for example, in, in 2019, you had around 550,000 Americans arrested for, for cannabis. In 2020, during the peak of the pandemic, you still had 350,000 people arrested. Now, this means one of two things. Either America is the most criminal country on the planet, um, or there's something kind of structurally flawed in our laws that means that so many people ended up uh, getting um, kind of involved in the criminal justice system. And so this combination of both people who end up in jail, who are a subset of those who are getting arrested, but also just the people who have the arrests on the record that, um, or who have an arrest record that ends up um, really kind of impeding their ability to be uh, fully contributing members of society. Um, both of those are, are, are issues that, that uh, do need to be addressed because the preponderance of these people are nonviolent offenders, um, and you know the the unfortunately it has become so easy to demonize the the cannabis offender as a criminal when um, you know they are portrayed as the large aggressive angry um, black man in particular. Um, but but somehow we have this cognitive dissonance that allows us to continue to think about the rest of the population that consumes cannabis is not criminals, but just people who are um, doing what they need to do to, to achieve their health, wellness, and, and kind of relaxation goals. Um, until we find a way to reconcile that disconnect uh, uh, in, 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 in the creating a harmonized view of how we view the cannabis consumer, recognizing that the overwhelming majority of cannabis consumers are nonviolent, uh, acknowledging the inequity that these laws have been enforced. Um, I think this is going to remain an intractable issue. And unfortunately, while the, the um, activists have done a phenomenal job in trying to elevate this issue. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of lawmakers who have continued to um, fail to pay at the level, pay this the level of attention that I think it deserves, um, because it is it is uh, a truly extraordinary part of American society um, that that we have come to accept this as just par for the course. Uh, when there are so many largely nonviolent uh, um, uh, consumers who are getting caught in this dragnet, but that overwhelmingly represent just one subset of our society. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, well, on a more optimistic note, before we before we wrap up, um, Niambi, any any hopes or or predictions for uh, the future of justice cannabis reform? Um, well, I I can appreciate that the conversation around social justice is 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 happening. You know, it's happening in every single space that legalization is is happening, and although um, there needs to be a lot more. Um, we need a lot more progress in the area around social justice. I definitely know that we're, you know, um, a long way away from the days of 1976 when my father released the album and it was banned on the Jamaican radio station, you know, and so I can, um, I am hopeful. I, I know that unfortunately we, we live in a, a country that everything boils down to politics. And so although we can, we all as Americans can say, you know, this should be legal. We sit and watch, you know, time after time, the Moore Act or um, any other bill that's kind of put forward around cannabis legalization be kind of passed around or, or looked over really just due to, to politics. And so uh, I'm not sure the when it's, it's you know, I, it's not like if it's gonna happen, we now just know that, it's a matter of when, you know, full legalization will happen. And, um, you know, the, the activists are showing up in every space to, to make the, the need known that social justice uh, has to be a part of legalization. So I am very hopeful in that regard. Amazing. And John, anything from you? Any, any hopes, expectations, predictions? Well, I, I think the, the speed at which cannabis normalization is happening in our society um, is creating a tide that is irreversible. You know, when, when we're now at the point where 18% uh, of cannabis of, of American adults report consuming uh, at least once a year, you know, 12%, more than one in 10 report consuming at least once a month. Um, this has just become such a, a kind of normalized facet of American society that even as um, the law may be slow in, in, in reforming. The politicians particularly have been slow in coming to the table. Uh, in most of Americans' minds now, this is increasingly just a settled issue. Um, and I think we are, we are on the cusp of a generation for whom the idea that cannabis prohibition is as aggressive and as punitive and as destructive as it has been over the last few generations will be a tro totally kind of a disorienting uh, uh, credulity inducing uh, thing because uh, in their world you know cannabis is going to be viewed as acceptable and as normalized as alcohol in many cases it's going to be viewed as a safer um, substance than, than alcohol and I think that is going to be a foundation for reform that uh, regardless of how quickly or slowly the politicians move I think will set a basis for a truly new and radically uh, reformed place for cannabis in American society. Thank you so much. Well, Niami, we ask all of our Kenya Week guests, we give them the opportunity to give a shout out to someone in the industry that you think are is doing amazing things. So you have the floor. Um, well, I'd like to give a shout out to Roz McCarthy, who um, is the director and the head of Minorities for Medi Medical Marijuana. Um, I've seen her uh, work maybe 50 times <laughs> as as hard as uh, anyone in the industry, whether for profit or nonprofit. Um, she shows up in every space, making sure that uh, social justice is at the forefront of every single conversation in every state uh, where the conversation is happening around legalization. And so I have to definitely tip my hat to her. Um, and she's launching her, her new cannabis brand now, um, CBD uh, Buddha. Um, I don't want to get it wrong, damn. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, she's she's a phenomenal woman, and and she um, you know being the the director of one of the largest uh, minority membership uh, cannabis organizations, nonprofit organizations in the country is just um, something that is remarkable. We love Roz. We've had her on the show. Yes. She is a <laughs> phenomenal force, and she's yeah. That's just with her in Miami and it's Black Buddha Cannabis. So yes, thank you. Black <laughs> Buddha Cannabis. Black Buddha Cannabis. I'm never going to forget. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for your time and thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, I know I, ca I can't imagine having to, you know, just verbalize that over and over again. And we, we appreciate you sharing it with us so much. 
Um, and thank you to our listeners for joining us at Canada Week. Please be sure again to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And um, if you haven't seen it already, New Frontier Data just released our 2022 cannabis report. You can find it at newfrontierdata.com backslash us cannabis 2022. I'm your host, Heather Wicklin, and we will see you next time.